everything else versus Bitcoin essentially gets spent and dies. I want to be able to have reactive security. And I think OpVault is to date the most straightforward, easiest to use way to do that. I will not be insulted by a clockmaker. <laughs> Overall, these kind of ways to make the network easier to both build on and interact with, I think is a really big deal. If Bitcoin existed when we started Twitter, we would not have to go down the ad model path. I mean, as simple as that. Integrating Lightning into a social network is the killer app. Hello, and welcome to the Bitcoin.Review podcast, where we explore developments and projects with the people who actually make them happen. The show is supported by Pod 2.0, Sat Streaming, and CoinKite. If you're a new listener, I'm NVK. I run CoinKite, where we've been helping people secure their Bitcoins for over a decade. We make the cold card and fun products like the Block Clock. You can find more information about it on CoinKite.com. Hello, and welcome back to the Bitcoin.Review with a little bit of tan from Miami. Finally out of there. That was a lot of fun. Saw a couple of you guys there. So... Today, we have a pretty cool panel here, Mr. Future Paul. Hello. Hello. That was, uh, that was deep. Steve, hi. Welcome back. Hi. There you go. Uh, I like the high today. signal here. <laughs> no, I love the high <laughs> signal here. We're going to get through the whole list this way. <laughs> Stefan, uh, welcome back. Hey, great to be back and uh, on the, the list show. Wonderful, guys. All right. So uh, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping here. So uh, OpenSats, you know, we are, we are getting a ton of applications, but we have a lot of money to push out there. So guys, keep those applications coming. And uh, if you want to work on Core full time, we have like a bunch of grants to give out for that. Like full time, you know, 150K a year kind of thing you know, for the foreseeable future, for as long as we can fund it, we'll do it. So uh, please do apply. Mind you, we will review those applications very thoroughly. So it's going to be fun. Same for Noster people, working on projects, doing stuff. Like, please apply. We want to get this this funding out there. Can I ask you a question about that, MVK? Yeah, sure. For like for a core core developer uh, or maintainer who's has its strong track record, would you consider greater than one year? Uh, grant. Oh, absolutely. So, so the goal is to renew for as long as we have funding. It could be ten years. It could be a hundred years. Uh, we know we can guarantee the first year, but but the goal is to renew. And people who have been approved are doing good work. Will get priority to get their funding renewed. Okay. And it's not just one. Like, you know, let's let's make it ten people. Let's make it twenty people. But we do want to make sure that you know, like, we have both like people getting renewed, but also fresh people coming in. So, you know, it's a bit of everything. Yeah. I saw James O'Byrne tweet. He might be looking for a, a core journeyman to there you help go. him. For the SEM UTXO stuff. So like somebody he's willing to mentor if they have some C++ experience. So you heard uh, it here. We are going to fund a friend for James. <laughs> uh, no, James is a great guy. Seriously, it would be an honor to work with him. The reason I asked that, um, I so the way you described your philosophy is is pretty much exactly what Spirals is as well. I know but, we copied you guys. Heard, yeah, it's good. good. We're <laughs> we're open source. You can copy. Um, but I've I've heard feedback like other organizations will give multi year upfront grants. Like MIT DCI has done that for a couple of core developers in the past. And um, I agree with everything you said, obviously, because that's what Spiral does in terms of bringing new people in and, re and renewing. But I think especially like maintainers and long, t long time core contributors don't want to have to go out and like have the stress of, of fundraising every six or 12 months. So I just. Yeah, curious. I think like personally, just being pragmatic, what I normally suggest to people is like if they if they are not already somebody who's like have some monetary, you know, like being a maintainer, is that, you know, apply for a smaller grant, right? Like get in there and then build a little bit of wrap because then it gets easier for you to ask more. The more you ask for, you know what I mean? Like the harder it is for us to approve by you know, default. So do get in there. If you already are somebody who's known and, you know, is important to the project, like by all means, the same, you know, and, and we're going to take everything in consideration. 
you know, there's a nine people board. It's pretty chill. Everybody there just wants Bitcoin to win. And it's passed through. So <laughs> we're literally doing this because we just want more work for free. <laughs> so just keep that in mind. All right. The next thing is um, I got tired of people not understanding how reproducible builds work. And there is a lot of, um, let's call it amateur, shoddy sort of stuff out there that does this kind of work. So I can't remember uh, who made the PR on our uh, docs, but there is a new document there. The link is on the show notes. My real redirect is not working yet, but um, it goes explaining into nauseam of how reproducible builds work. If still after that you can't do it or can't understand why this works, then you should probably uh, reassess uh, what you're doing in life uh, as an auditor of these things. Do you think it's Steve? Pro like, do you think I could do it? Can I follow these instructions? Oh, absolutely. You, you can definitely do it, especially if you're on a Mac. It's a bit easier than than if you're doing on a, on on Linux. Linux is a shitcoin. Or FreeBSD is great. FreeBSD is easier too. Yes, yeah, so you can definitely do it. And if you want to do it, I wouldn't follow this guide. This is even more technical than you want, Steve. You can just follow, like, there's 50 other guides out there on how to do it, like, step by step. Okay. This is to prove explaining byte per byte everything that's happening. If somebody doesn't understand why, for example, the signature bytes don't match, it's because you don't have the keys to sign the code. <laughs> so, you know, it's a bunch of like industry standards and things that we go over there. It's, it's kind of, it's a very cool document. I highly recommend people that are curious about reproducible builds to, to go read it. So that's that for uh, the housekeeping. Why don't we start with the hot topics, which is the security updates. There was a mini script vulnerability on Ledger. The guys from Lena disclose correctly, beautifully to Ledger. There is absolutely no like guilt or anything to shun Ledger for this because it's very early days of Miniscript. And this is exactly what you want. We want to be gentle and nice to the people who are building new Bitcoin things, especially not in production. And we want people to find the problems and the bugs so that it doesn't happen when people actually have money on it. I don't know, have you guys looked at the Miniscript vulnerability? It was kind of interesting. I just lightly uh, looked at it, but I had the same impression that it's that now's the time to catch this, not later. That's right. Even though um, I kind of view out of the most, you know, the popular hardware wallets, Ledger is sort of the most shitcoiny. I, I actually was, I've been impressed with some of the Bitcoin stuff they've done. Um, yeah, I mean, Salvatore, he's great. He's like essentially yeah. Bitcoin assigned. <laughs> <laughs> he, you know, thank you, Charles, for putting a guy just working on Bitcoin. Yeah, so credit to them for that, and it's great to see them uh, adding Miniscript. Um, it was an interpreter bug, uh, in case anybody, and we have the link on the show notes to uh, people who want to see. Okay, now the second part, <laughs> the whole ledger debacle. I, I'm not going to get too much into full detail, I just kind of wanted to summarize because it is top of mind for a lot of people. We will have a wallet trade-off panel. Hopefully uh, uh, the guys from Ledger will also join. Uh, I'm working on getting uh, Larry from Jade to join. So like there is a, a nice little like people who actually write harder wallet code talking about it. I think it's a lot more productive than having any marketing people in it. Otherwise we don't get anywhere. So. Here's what happened. Ledger launched a new feature. It's essentially a way for them to Shamir secret shard your private key inside the device and push it to three different custodians of essentially this information separately, right? So each of them gets a Shamir secret share uh, on a two out of three schema. And with that, if you, you KYC yourself, and if you lose your private key, you KYC yourself again, and they send it back to your device, right? So essentially, that's the feature. Now, and it's 10 bucks a month. So now, there is a bunch of things <laughs> that happen and, and sort of like some nuance that's important for people to understand here. So first is... They had a, a bit of a miscommunication between the marketing department <laughs> and, and the devs. So the feature got pushed. And it's kind of a big deal because now you have an API 
to remove private keys of the device and send it to the cloud. We can get into arguments about implementation risk, you know, attack surface and all that stuff. So in the best case scenario, let's say there is no issues with it. Uh, you still have the concern that people were not aware that they were installing this. You still have to enroll for your keys to be sent. Now, part of that documentation that was very unclear to people is that the custodians of the Shamir secret shares have access to your funds. So they could collude either via you know, malicious or mistake or government request or you know a myriad of reasons of why three independent businesses could collude and they could take your funds, right? Not great. And then there is the fact that you're sharing KYC information that's not linked to your Bitcoin, so it's more information that could be leaked. Listen, these are professionals. These are good businesses. They're not malicious. But, you know, shit happens, right? I mean, we've seen KYC information being leaked before, accidentally or whatever. Uh, we've seen many things happen before. So, so that's one part of this. Now, the other part is the implementation risk, right? You now have this API. You now have more attack surface. You know, if Charles was here, to his credit, he'd be arguing with me that, you know, this was audited and you can't do, you can't attack, you can't take the seat outs. But, you know, me being me, I'd be like, but we designed our devices so there are, <laughs> are gaps, so you can't do this, so there is no attack surface. And we would be dancing for an hour and a half or two. So I just wanted to be fair to them and put that out there. So anyway, so, you know, then they doubled down on this thing and it became a marketing debacle on Twitter. But I, I just kind of wanted to give like a bit of a, a, a of like a unbiased overview of, of what happened. Uh, how do you guys feel about this stuff? Paul? I guess I had like a, I didn't have this crystallized conception of a hardware wallet. It's that it's like a computer designed to not allow the key to be exfiltrated. So uh, that's the kind of, so I didn't find this to be so ridiculously controversial. I mean, this, you know, split the SSR, or the, SS, the Shamir secret share stuff is, is cool to me. I think I can see a lot of people wanting this who want to trust other people. They want, they feel safer if other people are helping them secure stuff as kind of paradoxical as that sounds to a Bitcoiner. But, but I, I like the take that I heard from multiple people in Miami of just like, this should have been another brand. This should be a new product. The hardware wallet, it should be designed to make, if it's a computer and if it has access to a secret key, there's always going to be some firmware that could probably get that secret key off of it. But it, the ideally, it's being designed to make that as hard as possible. And this is, in some sense, a a circumvention of that design. You know, yeah. it's funny because I really think, and I was talking, you know, to a few people about this, and I think I, I talked to this about, like, with, uh, what's his name? With uh, uh, Pascal on the What Bitcoin Did. Pascal is the, the, the larger CEO. I think this is going to be a huge hit. I think normies out there, pre-coiners, are going to love the idea of having their coins held by somebody else in case they screw up. People People like banking because of that. I think this is a wrong way of getting people into Bitcoin because it's going to make people not have full self-sovereignty. And, you know, his point was like, listen, you know, like, you know, only a basis point of people would be criminals, right? Like, well, I mean, that's true until, you know, Castro's son, Mr. Trudeau, decides that the whole country is now illegal, right? Like, the whole point of Bitcoin is for you to hold it and not do that. Which, you know, we'll get into BitKey later too, which has another interesting uh, model around helping people recover, which is, I, I think, is a noble goal to try to find ways for people to recover. Yeah, I think I'll just add, I think the main thing Ledger could have done is really they could have put this into a separate product. I think probably there were two main things. So one was a bit of a disconnect between the marketing on Ledger's Twitter, like in, you know, just like a year ago, where it was kind of marketing people giving this impression of, oh, this private key never leaves your device because that's how secure our ledger device is, right? Because that's the marketing guys want to play it up. And then now this is kind of coming back and exposing the reality in a way. Um, so yeah, I think if they had just done it as a separate product, you know, and I appreciate there's a space for, you know, mass market product and there's a space for, you know, hardcore cold card with a multi-sig with different devices and different everything, you know? I think there's two things here, right? So one is like, I think we have to have a funnel 
right? Where it's like, here's the easier solutions. Here's like the intermediate. And like, hopefully everybody ends up with an air gap device for the majority of their money later, right? They get there and we should push people to keep on upgrading. Uh, the other thing too is, you know, this is probably, this is part of it because of shitcoins, right? If it wasn't for shitcoins, they could have used multisig instead of Shamir Secret and they could have had a more interesting setup. Right. Yeah. Shit coins push you to have bad trade-offs. Steve. I just wanted to comment. A simpler option they could have had instead of a whole nother product line is just a separate firmware version, which there's trade-offs between that and what you suggested, Stefan, but it's it still would have been better than what they announced, I think. Yeah. Because for yeah. their a lot of their existing customer base who really felt like this was a debacle for them, you know, if if they knew that there was they could still upgrade new firmware versions that did not have that code. They'd feel like you know there there wasn't that attack vector. I think that could have been a, a, a good move as well. And then I totally agree on the the Bitcoin focus. And I think we'll see that play out between like BitKey and Ledger. So BitKey has you know an advantage of being focused on on Bitcoin is that BitKey is going to use native multi-sig technology and hopefully someday Frost and just whatever the latest and greatest is. And that's going to enable a lot better user experience and security and peace of mind. So, you know, just a little bit of background, maybe like it, it's not, I think people assume maliciousness like too fast. And like, you know, I, I hope that people don't don't have that sentiment towards Ledger. It's just they are making trade-offs based on coming from the legacy security, PCI security uh, background. So in their mind is that like, listen, our stuff is all audited, secure and certified, right? Like, and it is fucking secure. However, Bitcoiners are coming from the other side, which is I trust no one. I want no certification. I want self-verification, right? And, and I think what we're seeing is the market is growing and like these two worlds are starting to collide and like in some pretty high sort Bunny of heads. corporate level now, right? And we're going to see even more of that. I, I think even from the Bitcoiner view it's um it's not like we expect every customer to like go do a reproducible build and audit things and so look at the code they just want the option for that to exist so that the security experts and the people who do take the time and are diligent do that so that you have a lot of independent verifiers so i think even for a, a mass market product that is a really important characteristic of these products the way i like to look at it it's like reproducible builds are essentially like a hanging rope on top of a hardware maker like us, right? So I just see like, you know, us with like little ropes running around and we're making cold card and we're all happy. And, but at any moment, a user can go and check, right? So like that keeps us in check because we can't do anything. And we see this every time we have a new firmware release, we change stuff, right? And then we push the code out and it's reproducible. And then users, especially high net worth or, or very technical users, they email us all the time saying, hey, why, why did you change this? Why, why did you do this this way? <laughs> you know, what did this byte change do? Right? Because people are watching. They really are in this space. So everybody benefits from this, this reproducibly built uh, setups. So anyways, that's, that's something on that. Along those lines, this is right right next on the list is that Ledger's like accelerating some open source stuff, which doesn't doesn't seem like they're accelerating open sourcing everything, but they at least the goodwill of hey, we open sourced some of these things that are highly controversial so that people can can look at them. I don't know that that's gonna placate anybody, but it's it's interesting that that was their first move. I mean, it is a market improvement. So I was talking to Charles, their CTO, just yesterday, and like they're still picking a license and stuff. I mean, it is nice that they're open sourcing a lot of things, but the problem is if you don't have a byte per byte of everything, you still have arbitrary code that you can't mm. review running on the device. I think yeah. it would be great for part of the market, right, that, that still wants the certification that trust thing, sort of like defer to a third party. But, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not a solution in my opinion. Yeah, it's a positive step, but it's not a solution. I mean, it's similar to like an iPhone app. You can open source the code, but you still can't you know, fully verify signatures and, and uh, do a reproducible build. So it's, it's certainly better to be able to see all, see all the code 
but you're you're still trusting that the binary you're running actually was built from that code. I, I still see this as like a market win, right? Like it's like it's a step forward, and hopefully they'll see a lot of sales because of that, and that would sort of like encourage them to make it even more verifiable, right? You know, it'd be a fucking amazing space if we have like all devices that touch people's Bitcoin being verifiable. Like you know, it's it's a it's a nice thing. Are you going to allow them to fork your license, or is that only source viewable? So uh, my license is actually not my license. Uh, MITCC was uh, open sourced <laughs> by, uh, I think it was Redis. I did write a license, okay. a new one from okay. scratch, but uh, I, I felt that it was not litigated yet. So it just adds risk and adds more complication. I didn't want to put something out there that people could get in trouble with. So, uh, so we, we killed that and we just went to the MITCC because it's so simple. Last thing I'd say about Ledger, I, I think having this new solution and feature for them is better than not having it in the market because it, you know, we can nitpick it and compare it against Cold Card and Trezor and, and things like that and find faults. But it's also always important to compare it to like keeping your coins on Binance or FTX or That's Coinbase right. or Exchange. That's right. And I think we would all agree, and I think Bitcoiners would agree, it would be better to use Ledger Recover than to keep it on an exchange like that. I don't know, man. I'm on the fence on that one, I must say. You think it's like a false sense of security for them? Or? Yeah, I think it does that. I also, you, you know, another problem too is that like these custodians are not like uh, bound by, say, banking laws that Coinbase is. Like, I, I don't know. It's a new set of trade offs that makes a lot of trade offs that like I, I'm still like, I still, I still think, need to think more before I'd say that's better than exchanges. It's it's not fully clear to me yet. Yeah, it'd be interesting. Like, does Binance have regulatory requirements and follow them that these custodians don't? I, I don't. I don't. I don't even know who the custodians are, so I don't know the answer. But yeah, well, it was interesting because there was just recently some news that they were commingling customer funds with their own funds. <laughs> oh yeah, just I mean, recently. But think, you know, like, I think this might have been like an insider leak or something. But there was some news about this. Binance was. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't think anybody holding on Binance expects Binance to be there the next morning when they log in. I think everybody who trades on Binance accepts that, like, you know, you have this offshore casino and you go do your, your gambling there and then you collect your winnings, hopefully, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, Coinbase, for all their faults, you know, at least they're, like, regulated locally, which is, you know, it's horrible. They are a horrible company. They're an enemy of Bitcoin. But, you know, like, there is at least some improvement over Binance. I don't know. Maybe there isn't. They can all fuck themselves. <laughs> it's kind of like the, the, the flaw in Lindy thinking is that, you know, it's like, oh, well, these have been around the longest, so they'll continue to be around the longest. It, it, it doesn't, it's not, so, it's, it's a helpful heuristic, but it's not sufficient for vetting something. Yeah, I mean, Lindy can be an inverse indicator, you know? Like, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think the whole Lindy thing, I mean, it gets so subjective, right? Because you could say, hey, um, you know, horses have been used for thousands of years, and then guess what? <laughs> Cars get invented. Yeah. Well, you know, so, you know, so. Well, yeah, on that note, we, maybe we stop beating on a dead horse. Yeah, yeah. Let's, let's stop beating a dead horse. <laughs> uh, all right. So we are going to start the software updates and releases, uh, and we're going to go start reading the, the updates now. Uh, signal. All right. So code card mark for 6.0.0.6.0.0x. This is the first edge release. It's six because the way we count firmware in the secure element, we couldn't just put nothing. Uh, <laughs> so the idea of this is, uh, so we have a parallel release now. So we have the standard release that's safe. It's everybody use. And then the edge release is for us to be able to release new complex, new features and don't put customers at risk. And devs can go do their stuff with a signed binary. This one includes Taproot. Taproot key span and Taproot multi-sig, sorted A, which is kind of nice. Paper walls can also be due A2 Taproot, which is kind of fun. Uh, and then there's a few limitations there that people can get into the details. We've also added uh, BSMS, which is a Bitcoin secure multi-sig setup. It's a BIP 129, so that we could make Hugo happy with Nunchuck. I'm still uncertain on the future of BSMS. 
And as I understand, this is like a separate um, firmware from the main line for cold card, right? This is like an opt-in firmware for Taproot support. Yeah, we, we try to make it even a little harder for you to find. Uh, we want this to be for devs. Taproot was a monumental change. Like it's a huge amount of code. And we don't want the average person, you know, hitting bugs or things with this. To kind of expose themselves to the risks and things, yeah. Can you illustrate some of the challenges? Like like what what's hard? Because I just use BDK, Taproot's easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, Steve. Steve did all the work. Not yeah, this thanks, Steve, Steve, the other Steve. Uh, oh, Mayor. Steve Myers, yeah. So, you know, first is Schnorr. <laughs> so there's a whole new crypto primitive there, right? That's absurdly big change. And that comes from libsec, from libsec, libsec P256K1, right? So we are using Core's implementation of Schnorr, uh, which is kind of nice. Uh, they did the work. And then uh, we updated libngu uh, to support all the taproot bindings and everything else. Uh, it's, just, it's just big. It's just a lot of stuff. You know, like everything is different. So... We figured uh, it would be important for you not to uh, try to impress women with your new <laughs> cold card firmware. I mean, is there like a roadmap to support music too, as well? When it, Absolutely. I mean, it's really close to being ready. but Yeah, so uh, next on this branch is going to be Miniscript and also PSBTV2. And then Moose, I don't know if it's going to go to Moose. Who knows? Maybe we're going to skip straight into Frost. I don't know where things are going to be by then. Maybe Musig is going to use a version of Frost. God knows. Like this stuff is still up in the air very much. Yeah. So we would follow what would be best for the users. I think even with the, even with the existence of Frost, you'll, um, you'll want to support Musig too as well. Like if, if someone wants yeah. to do it, N of N, it's just a simpler protocol and there's less interactivity requirements. Yeah, yeah. So it gets tricky with uh, with Musig Mus- 2 still has some interactivity, right? Uh, I don't know if they, I haven't checked like in a while. I don't know if they got to a point where you can just share, pre-share a bunch of nonsense and then you don't have to interact anymore or not. I don't know if they, Frost works like that. With Frost, essentially you can just share a batch of nonces and then the hardware wallet stores, you know, say a hundred nonces, and then you're set to make a hundred transactions, right? And what's cool about Frost is that you have roast. So you can essentially unenroll or cancel a share, right? I mean, it's kind of funny because this is like a, a big arc. Frost is essentially Shamir's secret <laughs> of, of the keys. So, you know, cryptographers being cryptographers. With a lot of advantages. Over. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Do you guys have to implement your own? Uh, I was going to ask if you're going to use Ledger's Miniscript library. For uh, do you guys have to implement your own Miniscript yep. implementation? Yeah, we have okay. to write everything from scratch. Well, but that's that's the usual. I mean, like we've always pretty much done that. The only thing we don't like doing ever, and is also part of the controversy with the original Cold Card uh, upbringing, is that we do not like writing crypto libraries. Nobody should write a crypto library. Every vendor should share the same crypto library, ideally. And Cold Card used to share the same crypto library as Trezor way back in the day. And part of the, the license controversy came from that. But just the, the crypto library. Everything else, you should go do your own fucking thing. Is your code base all C or have you introduced any Rust yet? I don't. We, we're not going to introduce Crust. Oh, I forgot you. you you're there there is no Crust in our shop. The code base is C, Assembly, and Python. So most of the business logic is all Python because we want it to be extremely, extremely legible. And then the things that Python can't do or need speed, we do it in C. And then sometimes we have to unfortunately do assembly for some some uh, some of the micros that we use require that. We're probably the last shop that does assembly. <laughs> but it needs to be done. So yeah. Uh, it's it's fun. I I think I think it's time Taproot's gonna start sort of going, you know, and uh, we wanted to support it. Yep. All right, Liana version one point zero Miami Sunrise. So uh, I bump into Kevin and uh, what's uh, what's his name? The other guy, Antoine. Antoine. Thank Antoine Pointsot. 
Yeah. That's right. Antoine uh, and Kevin in Miami, we talked a lot. I think they've convinced me. Liana is very cool. I still need to think more through like the, the trade-offs and backup and things, but we can talk a bit more here. So with this 1.0, they have uh, create, create span command now allows you to not provide any destination. Overall, there is a new layout color scheme. Uh, a bunch of GUI updates. So Liana right now is kind of like for devs, they need to make an app. Uh, what's interesting here is they essentially create a mini script script with a, a, a spanned now key and a time lock key, right? And what's interesting about this is you can create, like once you start depositing, say somebody creates a phone app with the Liana schema, right? Once you deposit in it, the phone can have a spend later key only. So when the phone spends funds, say it's set for one week, you only, it can only be, be um, validated a week from now. Uh, but if you do want to outspend whoever got your keys, you can go to the spend now key that you have in backup somewhere and outspend the attacker ahead of him. Uh, that's really cool. Here's a part that I don't get. What if the attacker never broadcasts a transaction? He uses push TX straight to a miner on the last minute. Yeah, interesting. Because I understand with Lightning, it's like, I think, well, I think depending on the HTLC, sometimes they use CSV, sometimes they use CLTV. So I think in that case, it's like a relative time lock. But as you're saying here, it's literally like uh, that exact time, right? Uh, maybe I'm missing something, and and to be honest, yeah. I'm probably missing something. Uh, I'm still trying to understand their setup without reading the paper. <laughs> Is this like a poor man's op fault? Yeah, because yeah, as I understand, this. it's kind of like a pre-computed. Like I guess it's like in um, James's paper, he talks about one of the ways to do it is like pre-computed addresses this is kind of like that approach right well this the the spending conditions of this are in the receiving utxo right that's yeah that's how this works yeah because yeah. it's uh so it's covenant-esque in the way that you're restraining yes. where the output is going and i guess that's a bit controversial because some people don't like the idea of covenants but a lot of developers like the covenants because of the functionality and scalability etc well it's only controversial for the people who don't understand Oliver. <laughs> That's probably a fair comment, I think. Yeah, <laughs> I'm just kidding. By the way, they, they do have a, a GUI now that looks like I just downloaded it, set it up, and put all my money in it. But yeah, so like the setup is you have a primary path and you set like what signer is for the primary path, and then you have a recovery path available after X number of blocks, and you can have a different signer for that recovery path. Okay. Yep. So it's using absolute time locks. That's the part that I can't remember. Okay. Too many projects to read. Well, either way, they, they have to be refreshed every period, like every whatever. Yeah. No, no, there is no refreshing. But if it's absolute time lock, they would need to refresh, wouldn't they? Well, only, I, I'm pretty sure that you'd have to recycle it somehow. No, no, otherwise, because, like, no, it's, it's all because of uh, the way the mini script is constructed. It's kind of like a multi-sig, I think, in a way. It's not making sense to me, though. See, that's the thing. I still don't understand it. <laughs> and nobody can fucking explain to me in a way that I can fucking understand it without having to go read the paper. Yeah, the intuitive thing to me is that you would need to recycle that because otherwise, like, how else do you... Anyway, yeah, we don't. maybe we need to just research that. No, anyways, yeah. the point is I said the same thing. They said, no, you don't. So I'm missing something. Yeah, it's worth more study. I haven't looked at it yet. Do we go read the paper now on the show? <laughs> make it even more boring <laughs> that's right for the people that don't know the the tagline of the show is we're gonna bore you to death <laughs> winnie all right nunchuck android version 1.9.3 message signing for tap signer and software keys add wallet force refresh option thanks hugo message signing with tap signer is fun uh, mempool.space rbf timelines that's great. Mempool Accelerator Service. Non-controversial feature. Mm -hmm. We should skip to the <laughs> next one. Just kidding. It's a fantastic feature, in my opinion. I think uh, it's always been available to the people who know. So essentially, if you're an OG, you know how to get your transactions passed through. If you're not, you're fucked. So 
I really think that what's cool about this feature is that it makes something that's possible to few now possible to everyone. And I think they, they made it in the most ethical way they could. Uh, you can Uncle Jim it. So like it's not linked to an account or anything. We see this issue all the time. Some people will send us money to pay an invoice on CoinKite's uh, shopping cart and it gets stuck because the, you know, the uh, the price is going up. They sent the money, so they want to get it confirmed. And uh, they put too low fee because they're cheap like right. me. And it gets away from them. Yeah. And then they can't, right? And they don't know how to, to send this to anyone to do it. So uh, this is really cool. I think it would be useful. So I'll put my adversarial uh, hat on. I mean, the concern is if it becomes super popular then wallets will be highly incentivized to strike a partnership with them and use the service because yeah. otherwise their fee estimates are going to be, you know, the gap will, the more popular the service gets, the more the gap will widen on fee estimates and wallets will become not competitive unless they use the service. Here's uh, the little secret that nobody wants to hear is that the fee estimation is already fucking garbage. <laughs> That's a fair point. Fee estimation is horrible. It is a guesstimate with all client software right now. Even the best fee estimation, which is mempool, still not great. I feel like everybody's just overpaying. That's why they get confirmed. So the way I see it is there is already no... This idea that there is only one mempool is already sort of like a lie. The miners all have their own. Everybody has sort of like their own. And it's really is just like us who care about this running core that might have something that resembles a big mempool. As the mempool grows, people are not going to update the settings to have a bigger mempool to fit all the transactions that so are going to keep on dropping off. And the way I see it is if this is anywhere near successful... Like mempool.space is going to have 50 competitors because like this is like printing money kind of feature. And the future of Bitcoin was, in my opinion, never to have a single mempool because it was it's not enforced by consensus. It's not something that you can inf like even enforce on others with uh, standardness. You know, it's just really wishy-washy. It goes, it's, it's almost the same argument as inverse full RBF. You know, like we're saying to people, use for RBF, like you can do it anyways. And it's stupid not to enforce it because people that don't want it won't do it. It's kind of the same thing. I think it's normal to fragment. I mean, the future of Bitcoin is to balkanize anything that's not consensus. Yeah. And one thing I've seen Wiz mention, and OK, we'll see where it goes. But I think Wiz from mempool.space has mentioned that they are going to try to be as open as they can about it. So we'll see. Maybe they make some of that actual estimation um, a bit more open also. So... Yeah, like that That might be another thing. Um, but yeah, it might be interesting that uh, it kind of helps push everyone into a full RBF world as well because if, if that's going to be the case, then people are going to, I think the, the momentum around full RBF will probably pick up. Yeah, now that we have full mempools, we're like, everybody's learning how do we deal how with this mempool. special form. How to mempool and, <laughs> and how should a wallet think of, you know, of bumping transactions. So the fact that this is it's all any transaction, what well, you know, some transactions aren't really, you know, RBFable according to my friends who understand these things. So like any transaction now can be can be accelerated or bumped. And so, you know, if you implement the the cool, you know, native protocol stuff, you can probably do it cheaper than mempool than mempool's accelerator. But if for whatever reason this transaction is it's more expensive to do that or it wouldn't work for this transaction, you just accelerate. So now you anticipate that every transaction that you publish can get into a block if you're willing if you're willing to pay enough. And a lot, what Stefan was saying, the mempool guys are telling me that you know they have. The, I think maybe they already have this API, but they're going to make it available. They have their expected block. So like based on their view of the mempool. Here is what a miner seeking profitability. Here are the transactions that they would choose. So they're, you know, the more of the, especially if more of these services spin up, or if this gets used a lot, there's going to be kind of a big diff between, you know, the actual mine block and the expected block. It's kind of always been like that. You it's know, be fuck, we have empty but blocks. The data might be available. <laughs> you know, I know, but like, look at it. Like, we have empty blocks. Like you want more diff between the mempool and an empty block, <laughs> you, you, you know, like, and then you look at all like, you know, what the inscription kids are doing, right? Like they're going straight to miners and say like, get my inscription in. Like 
Bitcoin was designed this way, like like it or not, like you, you know, this is not part of consensus. I, I think I, I I think what we should do is we should focus our energy on figuring out ways of optimizing and making it as fair as possible under the circumstances, right? So essentially, create more competitive mempools to do stuff because you know all the bad people don't give a fuck about morals or ethics, and they're just gonna get around anyways. Yeah. I mean, I think there's at least three things that the overall ecosystem can do. One, there's still a lot of wallets that are not using the best fee estimation. And I mean, I agree. It's it's a fundamentally hard problem. So I agree. There's no perfect fee estimation. But still, if you look at all the different wallets, there's huge distribution of quality. So leveling that up is one thing that can be done. Two is just improving fee bumping techniques across all wallets. And within Lightning, anchor outputs is going gonna, is gonna to help. All the Lightning implementations have it except for LDK, but LDK is going to uh, add it in the next release. So that'll be in the Lightning implementations. But then the package relay work in Bitcoin Core is like the next step, the next evolution there to improve things um, for Layer 2s, in particular Lightning. Another thing that we haven't talked about yet is Stratum V2. I think it actually can help uh, as well, because instead of just having a, a handful of pools that do all the transaction selection and you know you you sort of know your partner list. <laughs> you just go talk to like seven companies, and you've got a huge portion of the hash rate. If you fast forward to a world where miners can do their own transaction selection, and you have thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of entities you'd need to contact to get a majority hash rate or a significant hash rate, that's gonna that's it becomes an intractable yeah. problem from like a business development perspective. Yeah, it's. Uh... Stratum V2 is going to make a huge difference, absolutely, because you're going to have all the small guys in the pools, you know, making their own blocks, right? Setting, like picking the transactions that go in it. So it further decentralizes a lot, you know. But Stratum V2 is not perfect. We still got to see where it goes and all that stuff. And you know, nothing's perfect. We're still iterating. It's fucking early, uh, right? So it's like chill, right, to everybody. It's just like. It's only been 14 years and we've already invented the mass money known to man. And we've, you know, like listening public traded companies, just like it's like chill, enjoy the journey and like try to invent more stuff. Right. But, you know, people people freak out about everything. What are you going to do? All right. So after the non-controversial thing, Electrum version 4.4.3. International internationally break multi sig intentionally. intentionally break multi sig wallets that have heterogeneous master keys. Version four point four point zero two four point four point two of Electro for Android. Uh, do not check that master key. Blah blah blah. I'm gonna skip that. So, anyways, Electrum has updated their wallet. Mercury wallet version. 0.8.13 dynamic backup TX base fees, hidden service Electrum endpoints require upgrade. Uh, do you guys use Mercury Wallet? I played around with it in the early days, like just just for the sake of like trying a state coin thing, um, but haven't tried it since. I think the main thing is I'm not so clear why a lot of people would use it, just because currently the functionality is kind of limited that if you want the privacy then you're only sending that set size of UTXO you can't you know s split and do things like that so but we'll see maybe maybe it'll improve over time with the new technology cool blue wallet version 6.4.3 add enable lightning off-chain wallet transactions to export to csv i love this all wallets should allow you to export everything to csv cuz you got to do accounting sometimes yeah, Craig Rowe is trying to talk about a way to standardize this across wallets. Yeah, there is. There is a yeah. BIP, and everybody's adopting the BIP. It's BIP 229, 249, or 239, I can't remember. Libwally Core version 0 0.9.0. .0. Security fixes. <laughs> okay. so uh, uh, BIP 329, by the way. I just looked it up for the Craig Rowe thing. But go on. Yeah. 329, right? Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, GCC version 13 and later underlining libsec 256k1zkp zkp is the so essentially like the edge release of libsec 
by core so that every time they have a new crypto primitive or something a little bit it's not quite there yet they put on zkp and then eventually when it matures it goes to the standard library uh pspt uh, add support for taproot key spend descriptor optimization bp85 elements uh, fix uh, and a few other fixes so libwally Start OS, formerly Embassy OS, version 0 0.3.4.2. Uh, highlights, uh, update, build system for server light. Uh, and that's probably a SQL light, not server light. NUC Bay server one, update to Linux version 6.1, rename Embassy to start, PWA support for start web interface. Bitcoin Mechanic works on this. So, yeah. I met an older lady in Miami who's like, <laughs> like she's just like hardcore cypherpunk, running Start Nine, just loving her life. She's like, my son in law said, you can't run this stuff yourself. You can't, you can't do it yourself. And I'm, I'm proving him wrong. <laughs> Good on <laughs> it. As, as NVK says, grandma doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah, so the proverbial grandma does not exist. We've we've come to this conclusion uh, somewhere that I can't remember. Might have been a panel. All right, RoboSats version 0.5.0-alpha. Bunch of changes. Lots of text. Uh, refer reward system. Prerequisites with coordination backhand that is fully enabled federated front end. Fair bond slashing. Max allow mining fee uh, for on-chain payouts. Uh, some easy disputes are resolved automatically. Cool. Have you guys used RoboSats yet? I have not. Nope. Okay. My Citadel desktop version 1.3 Pacific Eclipse. They might have missed the Miami conference. My Citadel 1.3 ships with support for more advanced mini scripts, account base, time locks, uh, multi sigs, and multi multiple user interface improvements, core functionality, account based in multi sigs with time locks and complex mini script descriptors, and a bunch of other UI improvements. Just looking at this, My Citadel is pretty cool GUI, GUI for understanding like what you could do with mini script. Like you can make your own Liana wallet, maybe. Oh, neat. Oh, is this the one that like looks like that uh, Python learning to code thing that you have like some some blocks that you put together? No, it's not blocks. It's just you like you add like conditions. So like at least one signature, and then from like does it has to be from a specific account or not? And then is there a time oh, thing? I see, you know. And that or at least two signatures at any time. You know, so like you just kind of make a, a list of rules that would cascade. Very cool. I think there's going to be a lot. Uh, there's also talks about making a mini script, uh, sort of like a vetted library. So essentially, people will like vouch for the fact that that mini script template has been audited, but either by them or by somebody else they know, and uh, it's sort of like safe to use uh, because mini script so like a little mini script app store. Kind of, yeah. Except it's free. Because like Miniscript is, is essentially like now you can do anything. That means people will mm. find any way to lose money, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like if people understood how many people lost money making complex P2SH scripts back in the day, like it, it's, 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 it's cry kind of situation. Right, uh, Blockstream, green, desktop, version 1.2.0, macOS universal build, support Wayland. I do not know what Wayland is. It's Mac OS, is it a Mac OS? No. Uh, display protocol. It's a window management for Linux. Okay. Uh, I see. Parman node. Mr. Parman writes some great, great guides and documents about Bitcoin. And uh, he decided to make his own little node in a box implementation. And uh, it's on version 3.2.2. Uh, very cool. Shout out. Keep on pushing. Whirlpool 0 0.23.36. 
add surges, add config, server, minor fee, surge, relay fee. Yeah. So I think surges are basically like the standard whirlpool previously was five inputs and five outputs. And I think now so the surge thing is like if there are more people, it can do more than five. Something like this. Okay. I have a question. I feel Samurai is like, it seems like one of those very divisive things within the ecosystem. I, where, where do you guys, are you guys fans of their software solutions or, or it, it seems like people either love it or hate it. I don't like any of the solutions except for Joy Markets. But Joy Markets doesn't have a reasonable UI. At the risk of having those guys come attack me on Twitter, I, I just have a question. Like, no, they will anyways. Even if you say you love them, they, they are, will still they come shit them. on you. It's just how they are. Now, my understanding is that a user is sending their XPub to their server, and it's intended to be a privacy solution. I just that just seems at odds. I don't I don't get that. Yeah. So so this is the problem. It's been one of my biggest gripes with the project. Is this the default doxes the users to them? Right, not great. Now, if you run your own dojo, which is the the server part, right, then you get privacy. But the problem is, you know, nobody fucking runs anything, right? I mean, as far as I know, maybe they have some data that proves me wrong. But anyways, that that's the thing. It's like if you want to use Samurai, by all means, use Samurai, and make sure you use Dojo if you're gonna use Samurai. It's the same for, for Wasabi. Like, you know, Wasabi now has chain analysis on the input. So, you know, if you're going to use Wasabi, use a different coordinator maybe, right? Uh, you know, that's why, you know, again, I like Joy Markets because Joy Markets doesn't have a centralized coordinator. It's just a market. I think we're going to see a lot of new stuff coming out in this year, next year, that will sort of like shake up this market a bit. Yeah. I mean, it's also worthwhile pointing out that you can use Whirlpool without using Samurai, right? So Sparrow Wallet is an easy way. And if you have Sparrow Wallet connected to your own Electrum server or some other Electrum server, then Samurai is not getting your XPubs, right? So, right, but if you're not using a dojo with Sparrow, you're still doxing yourself, right? Correct, but I mean, that's where, you know, you either use your own Electrum server or maybe it's like the Uncle Jim model. Maybe someone you know is running an Electrum server for you for you to run your Sparrow out of. Yep. Yeah, I mean, you know, the the best thing I can say to people is just like, if you don't have to move your TXOs, don't move your TXOs and wait for better privacy. But there are tools and they do work if you use them right. You know, the, the privacy set on both Wasabi and Samurai, if it's done right, it's it's quite good. Anyways, Orange Pio app 1.2.5 added events counter. Clicking on near you, new refresh the homepage, add user mailing, uh, email next to log out. Orange Peel is essentially a kind of like a, a dating app for finding Bitcoin friends. Daniel Prince uh, uh, got this going. <laughs> All right, Project Spotlight. Ellenscribe.xyz. Backup Lightning Channel State on Bitcoin immutable storage with inscriptions. <laughs> so it's, uh, I believe it's a static channel backup. There you to, go. Yeah, I think this was at the Bitcoin Plus Plus hackathon. You know, this uh, reminds me of that meme, you know, like whatever all the things. It's like inscribe all the things. <laughs> inscribe all the things. <laughs> and does that mean every time you open a new channel, your static channel backup, you need to make a new one? So does that mean you would have to inscribe yeah, it again? Every, right? so. No, every payment. <laughs> oh, yeah. damn, it's even worse than that. <laughs> Wait, every, static channel backup updates every payment? No, actually, well, no, I, mean, so I think that's right. I think static channel backup is only for the channel open and close, right? But but your actual yeah so your oh, yeah so right. stack channel backup is like a way to like hey I lost my node in a boating accident I have the stack channel backup I load up a new node with that and it closes all my channels because I don't know the state like you're saying Steve to 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 stay alive keep your channels open you have to know the very specific state of your channels well I think arguably SCBs are could be named better because it's you got to beg and plead with your channel partners to, to help you recover. But if you do a full, a, a self-sovereign full backup, then, then you need to, you would need to update it every, yeah, every payment, yeah. every payment, every state update. Yeah. I'm guessing that's, this is not that though, but yeah. Either way, this doesn't sound scalable to me. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. 
<laughs> L2 fixes this. <laughs> so Arc fixes all the things, right? <laughs> Recipe've had a good um, feedback thread on that recently, actually. So we're gonna talk about it. Don't worry. I think the the update is in the notes. Oh. Jotes reward loyalty program enabling brands of any size to offer customer Bitcoin rewards and digital assets. Bitcoin Legacy Project uh, fought an interactive timeline. Take a deep dive into the complete history of Bitcoin only cryptocurrency worth owing. Cool. I haven't checked it out, but cool. By the way. Uh, if people want to understand Bitcoin, you must understand pre-Bitcoin history. The Nakamoto Institute has a fantastic library of almost every paper that's related to Bitcoin prehistory. Highly, highly recommend. We just had Steve have a costume change. <laughs> <laughs> Getting ready for the next topic. Oh, I see. But we can't we can't see the logo, Steve. Oh, uh, look at that. Nice. Right, Steve, why don't you read the next update there? <laughs> LDK. <laughs> well, it, it's LNDK. LNDK, sorry. So it's a, a play on LND and LDK. So this is a project that Carla started and it now has like three or four different contributors to it. The goal here is to support Bolt 12 on LND and, and do it as an external project slash process. So... This would allow an LND user to, initially it's just to be able to forward Onion messages, but then the next step in the roadmap is to be able to recognize Bolt 12 offers and send Bolt 12 payments. Uh, and, and so an LND user can install the software and run it alongside LND to enable that. It doesn't require um, this functionality to be built into LND. So it's a good option to have. I mean, ideally, the LND project prioritizes on your messages in Bolt 12 and it's in integrated into LND. That, that's the best solution. But until such time, this is better than nothing. So you can imagine a world. This will, I think, help with adoption a lot because you'll have a lot of mobile wallets that are based on you know, Greenlight or LDK uh, or like Phoenix. They'll all support Bolt 12. But then you have a lot of like custodians, exchanges, servers that are running LND and if they don't support sending to Bolt 12, then they, they obviously couldn't send any of these wallets. But the, installing this software at least would allow them to send to Bolt 12. Do you want to read the notes? <laughs> oh, no, that's uh, that's the L deal LND, here. Sorry, I, sorry. LNDK is a standalone daemon that connects to LND via its gRPC API that aims to implement Bolt 12 functionality externally to LND. LNDK leverages the Lightning Development Kit to provide functionality acting as a thin shim between LND's APIs and LDK's Lightning library. Great. Dude, you're higher, dude. You can read the show notes much better than I can. <laughs> so that second point actually is interesting from the, for, like from the LDK project's perspective. It's cool that the implementation of, of um, Onion messages, or LDK's implementation of Onion messages and Bolt 12 offer and invoice parsing is all reused for this project. So... This this project it's a pretty lightweight project. It's just a it's it, it's a go between as I mean as they describe it a shim between L and D and L L D K to to offer the Bolt twelve functionality. We used to call those patches. You know, <laughs> this is a patch because you you, you refuse to fix. <laughs> <laughs> I I can say that. Well, the charitable. I mean, it's, it's nice to see code reuse, and that, that mm. there there is not a fourth implementation of onion messages in Bolt twelve. I mean, it's bound to happen, right? All right. Lightning and L2. Okay, software releases and project updates again. I, You know, this is L3 now. Cashew version 0 0.12.0. Big nut energy. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I love this project so much. Well, new token V3 format. The new token V3 format makes it a lot easier to parse Cashew tokens you're already supported by all non-cashier wallets. Coin selection of tokens from old epoch. So they have better coin selection, new REST API. They have a new NUT, Mint and Payment Hash. And miscellaneous uh, Mint now allows settings peg out by and uh, add Mint derivation path and enable Tor tests in, in CI. Very cool. I had a, sorry, go ahead, Steve. Do you, do you want to mention something? I'm just curious. 
I had listened to one of your previous episodes where Kali was on and talked about the potential to do some proofs. Is, is this mint info part part of that? Being able to to somehow try to get some accountability that there's not a fractional reserve. So yeah, I am not sure if this is it. There is a limit to my technical understanding of of DC cache implementations, but it is part of the roadmap to have some range proofs. Is it, is it actually possible? I thought it was like one of these things where it was like not possible. No, it is. It is. You can do range proofs. Oh. It, you know, it's not going to be precise, but there is ways for you to sort of like tame it. And if you do it often enough, it's very hard to cheat in between two, right? So right. you create a, a, a means, a statistical means of like, okay, this range is within, sorry, this mint is within range of how much it should be at. And you, you create a trend there, which is nice. Yeah, it's not perfect, but it's like, it'd be way better than nothing. Um, That's yeah. right. You could do it like every three three months or whatever. So you'd catch you'd catch the cheating within that window of time. And this goes back to why eCash is now nice and it was a shitcoin before. See, like before Bitcoin, you couldn't do any of this stuff and have a proof that leverages Bitcoin state, right? So essentially before it was just, trust me, here is some signature of whatever, right? Now it's kind of like, okay, now this is anchored on Bitcoin. It's a lot harder for you to to find some place to cheat. So now to me, eCash is layer three. Yeah. It doesn't seem like it's not a good solution for like a complete rug pull, instant rugging all the coins, but for the, a gradual, like if, you know, if there's a mistake, like an earnest company or a custodian trying to do this, it just has like a problem or mistake or, you know, small uh, leaking, it would detect that. Yeah. Also, it, yeah. I mean, like they could find their bugs too, right? Because you could have a printing bug. Uh, we called yeah. it the Federal Reserve, but you know, in our industry, we called it a bug. Yeah. So, so like, I had, I had to just related to this. Like, I had this tweet where I'm essentially like coming to this conclusion where like Bitcoin doesn't scale, Lightning doesn't scale. You know, they scale parts of it, right? So like, they're doing their job, but they have limitations. And you know, I, I you know, we don't have a UTXO for everyone. Uh, we we don't have a way to scale block size even for Lightning to become the coffee paying device, right? Lightning just gives us a little bit of breathing room to clear all this new sort of layer threes. That's what I call them because they don't clear into Bitcoin directly natively, right? They're just leveraging it. While layer two, in my view, you have to clear into Bitcoin. You're using UTXOs. So anyways, like, I feel like Bitcoiners are still a little bit sleeping on the eCash part because, you know, pre-Bitcoin eCash was a shit coin and Xiaomian is a bit of an interesting character. So I, I feel like, you know, same with the Noster thing. Is like, it's like it's not native Bitcoin, but without these things or who knows, maybe somebody comes up with something else not eCash related. Like, But without this extra things that base themselves on Bitcoin, we, we, we can't onboard 8 billion people. So that's sort of like where I'm at now. By the way, I was talking to Justin uh, in Miami, uh, Justin Moon, and uh, we we're joking that like, you know, with Frost, you could have it so that every participant in the Mint has a key. <laughs> so you have to have <laughs> democracy again because democracy is great, right? <laughs> so essentially everybody votes with their key uh, if it was Frost. I'm sure there'd be great latency on those transactions. Oh, yeah. Can you imagine the amount of nonsense you'd have to pre-share to accomplish that? But hey, that's what computers are for, right? Also, I think, I mean, like with the tornado cash debacle, I think in the past week or so, it just shows how these governance tokens and voting protocols are just not realistic. Democracy is a shitcoin. You don't, <laughs> you just don't have a knowledgeable enough I mean, first of all, there's apathy. Most people don't, quote, vote with their coins or tokens or whatever. And then the, those who do can easily be tricked and fooled because they have lives to live and they didn't, they can't parse every little detail. Yep. So Yeah, I mean, it goes beyond that. Like, nobody should have rights over other people's stuff. It really is that simple. And that's what democracy is. Uh, tyranny V2. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, mutiny, uh, Mr. Paul, do you want to read your own notes? Sure. Yeah, so Mutiny Node, which is the core written in Rust, 
based on LDK and BDK. Thank you again, Steve, for all your all your hard work. Yeah, uh, so while I was gone in Miami, Ben added uh, Noster Wallet Connect support. So you can set Mutiny as your Noster wallet. A Noster wallet connection string is made so that it can be imported into Noster clients like Delmas or Amethyst so that one tap zaps can happen non-custodially. This requires eventually opening the wallet if it's not running in the background. So you, you're you basically publishing events like intent to zap events. And if your wallet is open, it will see those events and do the zapping for you. Yeah, we've been refactoring some of the storage stuff so that we can be multi-platform so that you know Mutiny Wallet could run on a server or in mobile apps. So getting away from some of the like really browser specific stuff we had in there. So we got it on mainnet a week or so ago, so I could carry it around in Miami. And um, it's a little slow to launch right now, so we've been trying to optimize you know, how we get network graph data and the rapid gossip sync, because uh, those are kind of the things that the wallet needs to know to have, have an understanding of the world. And yeah, we added some opening channels to L- the LSP instead of just having the, the LSP open channels to you. And then today we just launched it on Signet. So you can view the, you can use the Signet version of Mutiny Wallet, uh, which is interoperable with Fetty. So that Fetty just launched on Mutiny Net Signet, the Fetty Alpha. And so we're like, well, it's fun to send back and forth. So let's just make sure our, our wallet's available as well. So people will have like two wallets to, to send back and forth. Uh, but yeah, there's like a, there's, there's a ton of features. Uh, so not I, not everything is like exposed in in the UI. There's like a I know what I'm doing button in the bottom of the settings where you can find all sorts of different experiments. We've got LN URL auth. Just, just there's so there's so many different things to build. Uh, but like you want to send and receive on Lightning and on Chain, on Signet, on MutinyNet uh, between Fetty. That now's the time. So if you go to C- Signet app signet-app.mutinywallet.com you just start playing with it very cool 50 ways to lose money (laughs) (laughs) soon to not fake money no this project is fantastic what you guys are building in mutiny is much needed a few comments Uh, first of all thanks for using ldk and bdk this is exactly what we had in mind creating those projects uh i also wanted to clarify i actually don't do any work uh as MVK would point out, I'm just like a PM. I don't actually. Yeah, it, PMs are an attack surface on Bitcoin <laughs> because they don't do anything, but they're like very good at directing people to do stupid shit that they shouldn't be doing. Managerial overhead here, but thanks to the developers in those projects. I had a comment on the the first bullet point around N- NWC. Mm. I know there's a lot of excitement around it. I mean, there's no doubt. Like anyone who's used, you know, Zaps on Damas or any any. Nostra client knows that, you know, if you tap the zap button and then have to go through like 10 more steps and switch apps and stuff, it's not a clean, smooth experience. It's horrible. So getting that to be one tap is undoubtedly a massive UX win. But as you know, you know, if the wallet's not, it, the, the a concern I have about NWC and other approaches that use some kind of server API is that you're, you become dependent on the, the, the OS policy of are you going to schedule a wallet app to wake up? Well, I mean, it's either a custodial wallet, but if you want to support Mm -hmm. non-custodial wallets, which I think we all want to see supported, then um, you're dependent on the OS waking up the app on the phone to sign the key, you know, use the keys to sign the transaction. So I'm I'm interested in pushing for prototyping and, and exploration of using intents on Android and hopefully eventually iOS, because then you can keep it all client side. Like the Domus app or whatever app you're using can just use Android intents to talk to the wallet locally. It's 100% certain it'll work. There's no there's no like server calls or push notice or waking up the app. And it doesn't require the GUI context switch. Like from the user perspective, it just happens in the background. And you can sort of pre-authenticate how much you're willing to spend without confirming it. So an intent is like an API that your app exposes. Yeah, and this has been available on Android like since I was at Google ten years okay. ago. <laughs> is there an iOS equivalent? The good news is, like a year ago, they introduced intents. 
that's basically the same thing. The bad news is mm-hmm. it's only limited to like Siri and a few like the Apple suite of apps. So I'm crossing my fingers that next month when they have their big developer announcements that they'll expand that and be more equivalent of Android. If so, that would be amazing. Th- then I think it's a home run. Uh, th- then I think it's That'd like be awesome. It'd still be good to, for someone to to prototype this, prove it out. But then I think it's a, a no brainer technical approach to this. You, you get the UX win that like NWC is demonstrating now, but non custodial wallets will work and it'll work 100 percent reliably. Yeah, I know one of the, at least for the web platform, uh, like one of the limitations Apple places, like if you want your app to wake up and do something in the background, you have to show a visible push notification. <laughs> so like, imagine you tap to zap and then there's like a, like a push notification on the top of your screen, like you are zapping somebody and then that wakes up the app and does it. Yeah, there's, it's pretty hacky. So that sounds like the ideal solution if we can get there. Yeah, there is reasons why they do that, but you know. It's it's like oh yeah, there's good reasons. Yeah, but, but it's one of those things that like uh, you know I kind of wish they just had a like a setting for it that you choose as a user. You know, like maybe the default is what Apple have. They often make good decisions on design, mm-hmm. like because you know you can't compare the experience on an iOS and on an Android phone, right? Like, but you know I just wish you could overwrite some of this stuff. If Mutiny Wall is awake in the background, which happens typically on like a higher powered Android phone the NWCs just go through. So like if, if it's if it's awake, it's just it's just working automatically. Nice. Any other things you want to mention on on uh, mutiny or Yeah, we're hoping to hoping to get like start adding people on mainnet on the wait list uh, pretty soon. So like hopefully maybe this week. But uh yeah we're just there's just there's a lot to build, but we've made a lot of progress. What are you doing on a podcast that's two and a half hours long? <laughs> Should be coding now, man. I thought it was only two hours long. <laughs> there is slippage. No, that's that's the delivered cut time. <laughs> All right. I'll be version two point zero point zero Twilight in a flower. UI upgrades, new account management features, updated to web extension, manifest version three, customatic partnership, uh, the, the, the bunch of interesting other little things here. I'm not going to go through everything. Albi is really cool. I use it. Uh, when you zap the sh- zap or boost a, boost a gram the show, it goes to my Albi node. And uh, so far, it's the only lightning project that i've used that can receive a obnoxious amount of transactions and still work it has never had downtime and i have never had a problem of a payment not going out or coming in so uh props to boomy oh and they have amazing uh uh, browser extension too that you know you use it for a lot of noster stuff i don't know i feel like these guys are really coldy all right, Ellen Bits 0.10.7. Adding IT properly, fix old payments endpoints for LND Hub, added Welsh, and a bunch of other things. LND is the CTO of LND is Kali, who codes eCash. So uh, if you guys wanted to know a connection there, the guy is prolific. Core Lightning. No, there is no Core Lightning. Core Lightning doesn't exist. It's C Lightning. Seat Lightning version 23.05, Austin, Texas, agreement, ATXA. Highlights for users, new uh, commando, blacklist, fee rate, added to new options, uh, list, close channels, uh, RPC to show old, dead channels, reckless added support for Node.js, Spending unilateral closed transactions now use dynamic fees. Uh, highlights for the network blinded payments are now supported by default, and a few other things. Any comments, guys? My only a uh, fun fact I just recalled this the other day, but someone like three years ago, some developer integrated LDK, which was very premature three years ago, into Bitcoin Core, opened up a PR and called it Core Lightning. So I haven't, <laughs> I need to, to, to rib the Blockstream guys that they stole That's the funny. name from this developer. 
Oh, no, I, I keep on giving them shit, I think, on pretty much every episode. Uh, Johnny, what we should do is, uh, going forward on the notes, just put a sea lightning so I don't even say the word core anymore, because I don't, my brain can't dissimulate. So uh, we're, we're going we're gonna to guilt them into charging, changing back to sea lightning. Plus, C is better than C++ on core. So, you know, let's, uh, you guys should take advantage of the fact that it's just C. Make that shine. Thanks, Steve. We're gonna add to the show notes the 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 core lightning original uh, original owner. All right, Torque version zero point twenty two point one. Not gonna read the notes, but Torque is really cool. Great way for you to manage nodes, lightning nodes, if you're doing this at an enterprise level. Very pretty UI. Satimoto version zero point four point four pre release. This release adds Breeze SDK as backend. Well, that's interesting if it's the first one I hear about. Uh, Breeze SDK uses Blockstream Greenlight as a virtual node provider. Interesting. SwissPay, 1.8.0. No KYC, no hardware, non-custodial Bitcoin POS. Very cool. Polar version 2.0.0-RC3. One-click Bitcoin Lightning networks for local app development and testing. Neuda Wallet, version 0.1.8. Android Lightning Wallet supports Lightning payments and automatic management using LSPs. Wavelake. So Wavelake is cool. Uh, they've added more features. It's like now it's like a Noster value for value place to put music. Kind of neat. River, Ellen, you're all implemented. Uh, thanks, Alex. Project Spotlight, Zap Planner by Albi Labs. Recurring payments are lightning transfers sent within time intervals defined by you. Well, that's kind of cool. It's like a, okay. Some some business logic over, li over Zaps. Steve, when when are you going to update your, your Noster profile and like, you know, participate so we can maybe zap you? For your PMing, I almost take joy in not updating that. It <laughs> create an alt account. It could be like a PM hater, you know, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck PMs, you know. Nobody's gonna figure out that. Then you can participate in the hating of your old profile. <laughs> that would be like beautiful. So we should start a campaign to get Steve on Noster actively. I, I I open I open Damas uh, daily. I'm 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 a I'm a lurker. Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah, not so much on the dev mailing list. <laughs> uh, Vertex Lightning and Taproot enable collaborative transactions. Okay, that's cool. So more mixing. That's coming. That's coming to mutiny. That's a a play on the mutiny feature. Ben Ben Carmen's. Uh, coin join implementation so you can coin join into a lightning channel and i'm, ex I'm excited the cold cards getting tap root because i you know it'd also be nice to be cold you know it's 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 a tap root based coin join implementation so it'd be nice to be able to coin join into cold storage using cold card very cool i, I wonder if you guys can get that to run on ck bunker that could be neat because then you can have an hsm over usb hmm. running it uh, Stefan, I, I know you have to leave in a few minutes. So, like, do you have anything you want to add just generally or? Yeah, no, nothing in particular to add, really. Um, I think, uh, yeah, it was good chatting with you guys. And, uh, yeah, let's just see uh, what, what keeps coming out. It'll be interesting. I think probably the main thing is just kind of dealing with, uh, you know, wrestling with what, what's appropriate for the mass market and what's appropriate for the, for the hardcores. And maybe that's, that's going to be a source of conflict, but also there'll be some innovation that comes. So, yeah, that's probably all for me. Yeah, that's probably the, the next big uh, conflict uh, source. Listen, thank you. Thank you for coming and uh, participating. Uh, I'm, I'm sure I'll see you soon. Yeah, thanks, guys. See you all soon. Bye. See ya. Bye-bye. Later. Okay, now that we've cut some some dead weight, we can continue with the list. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding, we love. I, I can leave now too if, if you'd cool. like. <laughs> <laughs> oh no no no! We can still shit on PMs more. Uh, <laughs> you know, wallet a reference open source non custodial Lightning wallet, built with React Native for Android and iOS. Building with the LDK. 
Is it? Another LDK project. Very cool. See, if you weren't here, we wouldn't know. It's not on the notes. <laughs> it looks like they're using the Bitcoin design reference too, so that's cool. Very cool. Yeah, and it's. I think it's going to go through a design review with the Bitcoin design community too. Nice. Noster, software updates, demos. Uh, when Zap incorporated with Aubi, so essentially now you have the Noster Wallet Connect thing going on and you can zap within the app without having to open a, a wallet. It's really cool. So we, there's a lot of Noster updates. Uh, what we've done is we're going to do a Noster list and the Noster things that are listed here are essentially like very related to Bitcoin or kind of important. Uh, but otherwise, we've left like maybe a thousand <laughs> software updates on a different uh, for for a different show because uh, it was getting out of control. We're going to have to add another two hours to the to the show. All right, so Noster Zap, Zap any Noster and Pub from anywhere. Add a Noster Zap target to ID to element to your site in specific target and Pub using data and Pub attribute. This is really cool. Paul, oh, is this what you guys are using uh, to zap from Mutiny? No, I'm just I'm I'm just hearing about this. Look look at this. No, no, it's uh, it's um oh <laughs> they are using Blaster. It looks like <laughs> I mean, who does and Blaster is awesome. <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, no, I I don't know what this is, but this seems cool. <laughs> you just add a script tag and you add like which in pub you want to be zappable, and then you now you have a button. That can do that can do zapping and just pops up a QR code that you you scan to pay. This is what I love about Noster is like they really the fuck it approach. <laughs> it's like we're just gonna <laughs> brute force our way into making this feature happen, kind of thing, which is like the complete different approach as Bitcoin and things. So it's uh, it's fun and fresh. Uh, Noster control a core lightning plugin, C <sighs> lightning plugin that allows you to talk to your node over Noster DMs. That's cool. This is pretty cool. Like, it, it, I thought it was using DMs as like a communication no. channel, but the, it's literally just like slash invoice. <laughs> like It's like chat commands. It. And it's a chat bot. It's a chat bot to talk to your, yeah. to your lightning node. That's fun. Wasabi Noster, a simple application that allows you to discover Wasabi coordinators over Noster. Nice. I mean, you know, I kind of see Noster as essentially an alternative to HTTP, to HTTP. You know, that that's the cool thing. It's like people are building very, very bare building blocks. Now they understand that Noster is good for that. So we essentially now have an alternative to HTTP, right? Like that's super powerful. I agree. That that to me is what's exciting. Thinking about Noster as like a Twitter competitor is not the right frame of mind no it's not but that's how we get them you know yeah you know they come for the shit posts and they they and they stay for the revolution right is that the right order <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's this kind of fun mindset shift where you see where like you're like i'm going to add noster to an app and then it's like at some point you pass this certain invisible barrier and it's like wait Noster is the back end of my app. <laughs> yes, it is pretty amazing, right? I think like is this like chasm that you cross where you go from like like holy shit! If I just load my NSAC here, all my shit shows up, right? It's exactly how Bitcoin works, and that sort of changed the whole paradigm of like how you do networking right on the internet right because now you don't have certificate authorities you don't have servers that need to participate in any of this shit you essentially just cut out the whole internet infrastructure except for the pipes and uh and hopefully they don't see that until we get a little bit more ahead all right um let's just read a few boostograms here there could be some funny ones all right. Thanks for everyone who streams sats and sends us shout outs. Uh, that's how we buy beer at the Bitcoin park and also uh, my budget for uh, zapping people. So uh, that that's that's what we do with the booths here. And also, I think 5% goes to open sats. All right. Ape Myth Radir. Fees go burr. <laughs> when splicing for Rio, please, sir, my family. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Obax uh, BTC map is okay. Uh, the open source map system, okay. You said when 
when splicing for real, Dusty gave a talk at Bitcoin Miami about splicing. Um, I'm sure there's going to be recording somewhere, but well, there's just an episode too on Bitcoin Review. That's right. Uh, we, we did. Well, that's okay. why he brought well, it up. I'm not a subscriber to Bitcoin Review. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, it's a decent pod. You should listen to it. Plus, I mean, like, you can do it like my wife. She listens so she can sleep. She's like, it literally oh, okay. puts my wife to sleep. <laughs> So I think splicing in Eclair and the Phoenix wallet plus CLN is somewhat imminent. Like definitely this year, probably in a f- few months. That that you know they, they've yeah, they're they're I think they're really close to interoperability testing and things like that. LD, LDK is going to has started to work on it, and um, the current goal is to have it in Q three of this year. My guess is actually it'll be. Given how complicated Bastion is saying it is, it's probably more like Q4, maybe even Q1 next year for LDK. So, uh, so two weeks. Yeah, Dusty was saying it, it affects every aspect of Lightning. See, w- when you get into those, I'm going to give you a good PM tip, Steve. Uh, when you get into those discussions about timing, you just say two weeks. <laughs> you worked for BFL, so it works for everyone. North of the wall, just sends us money. Vague, another informative uh, discussion. Hypocrites. Uh, helping with code one. Cheers. Do Bravco. There is so much stuff to check out that is hard to move uh, on any of it. Well, dude, just download lots of app, lose a few sats, and uh, that's, that's how we all move forward. All right. So Bitcoin Optech Newsletter. Uh, we're not going to cover everything because Schmidt now does a great job with their pod. But uh, any specific topics here you guys want to touch on? Uh, yeah, I mean, just on the, the LSP spec, I've been following along there. I, I'm really happy that that's or it, it's, it's showing great progress. I think it's really important because supporting mobile non-custodial is really hard. LSPs are appear to be pretty much fundamentally required to create a good user experience and manage liquidity and and channels for users. Uh, But that does pose a centralization risk. So one way to mitigate that risk is to have a a standard spec that wallets adopt, LSPs adopt, and make it realistic or, you know, reduce the the switching costs and make it realistic that a wallet slash user could even have multiple LSPs simultaneously. So I'm I'm happy to see really good progress there. And, And there's really good contribution from all the LSP players too. So I, I think, you know, over time it'll get heated with, with competition, but at least <laughs> at least now when it's an early market and everyone wants to just grow the, the pie, there is cooperation and coordination on that. So this is the, um, there's like five or so um, specs and this is one of them that was got mature enough that it was posted to the mailing list. Very cool. Uh, yeah, I haven't read this one specifically. Is this the one that is using um, like actual native lightning communication? Because like right now, Mutiny is is built based on you know the voltage LSP, which is just like a REST API. Like here's my invoice, and you get back a wrapped invoice. Uh, but I know that there's been work somebody's doing on just doing that messaging over over Lightning itself as the transportation protocol. Yeah. I believe this is that one. Yeah, there there was a really good discussion on the LSP spec Telegram channel about that. You know, debating using gRPC or HTTP or Lightning peer to peer, and um, you know that was actually a really healthy discussion with a lot of different views. But it stayed technical, and and people were listening, and I, I think it landed on, landed on a good choice because the problem with gRPC is then you can't support. In a browser, yeah. each choice there's trade offs, but I think the the best set of trade offs was what they landed on with the Lightning peer to peer. The well, Lightning peer to peer doesn't work natively in a browser either. But you know, for Mutiny, we're we're like proxying yeah. WebSockets to, to TCP. It'd be cool if if Lightning added just some date. I know there is some WebSocket. I think in C Lightning, Core Lightning. They, they get really triggered if you say C Lightning, so I know that's your point. But uh, just call it. I call it CLN. CLN. <laughs> Anyways, we proxy that on Mutiny. But if people aren't familiar, like LSP sounds like pretty abstract, but 
it's just funny because like every time I do like test, testing a wall, like we don't have our LSP on mainnet. So for Mutiny, I wanted to have Mutiny on mainnet so I could show it to people in Miami. So I do like the whole standard rigmarole. You, you make an on-chain transaction to your wallet. Then you pick, you know, nodes to open channels to. You open channels to them. But now you don't have any inbound liquidity. So you need to send... Uh, you need to send it out to now have inbound, you know, so like that, all that stuff. Whereas like the LSP UX is somebody wants to pay you on lightning and it doesn't matter what your balance is. You get that all as, as uh, liquidity. It's just, it just works. Uh, it's, it's just, it's a huge leap in UX and I, the trade-offs are not crazy. Very nice. Yeah, man. Like lightning is one of those things that like, you know, it, it took forever to come and still kind of like chugging, you know, a little bit of water there because it's fucking complicated. That's exactly what I was going to say. It really is. <laughs> it's like, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a, you know, I think he used the correct word, Paul. It's rigmarole. It's like a massive <laughs> rigmarole so that you can essentially like, you know, not clear those UATXOs, right? And, and like, it's like, it's like near insanity. But, you know, like it's making progress and it's becoming very usable. It is nice to see a lot of implementations. Can I touch on one more Optech bullet point there? Oh, absolutely. We have forever. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> I cleared my whole schedule today. <laughs> Literally forever, Laura. <laughs> Go for it. I wanted to touch on the um, Bitcoin Core developer meeting in Dublin. I didn't attend, but I've spoken to many people who did. And I also joined the, um, there's a weekly Bitcoin Core IRC meeting uh, on Thursdays. I've joined those. I feel like there's uh, really been a, a change of momentum and spirit and attitude on the project that I'm really excited about. You know, there's been a, a over the last few years, there's been a pretty big shift in maintainers, longtime maintainers moving out of that role, new maintainers. But I, I think the the um, just uh, some of the changes they're making, I think, are really healthy for the project. That project has long had a high priority list as a way to encourage a review, but it's always been ineffective and every single contributor acknowledges that. Like no one's ever been happy with that because it's not really a high priority list. It's it's more like each contributor gets to say, here's the one I want to add to the list. So it didn't actually help guide other contributors as to what they should review. It was just a laundry list of what everyone's working on. Now they're going with the approach of like, let's as a, uh, the contributors who are working on this project, let's pick three projects that we want to make serious progress on in the next release, if not fully merge in the next release. And as long as they stick to that, and then they're also actively identifying um, people who are going to review those PRs. Obviously, I mean, the person has, the developer has to say, yes, I want to, <laughs> to, to do it. But then once they... Once those developers say, yep, I'm going to review uh, package relay PRs, for example, then hold some accountability. Every weekly meeting, you know, actively discuss those projects and really put a, a shine a light on it and focus. It sounds simple project management, but it was lacking before. And just adding that, as long as they stick to it, I think that'll be great. I also think they're going to, that there seems to be good momentum around improving the reviews to get to get uh, to re right now rebase hell is an absolute disaster on bitcoin core where it can take years for a pr to get merged that's a good thing and that is due to uh you know if i if i author a pr you guys are the reviewers mvk might review it th this week and give it an ack but then paul doesn't get around to you know just paul has a bunch of other priorities and he doesn't get even though he cares about the pr he doesn't get around to reviewing it for two months and then guess what Paul says, Steve, you got to rebase. <laughs> and when I rebase it, it invalidates MVK's ACK. And it just, you get into the rebase hell. So just a little bit tighter coordination on timing of reviews can go, go uh, an enormous way to improve productivity on that project without sacrificing security, quality, decentralization. So I, I have a, maybe a, a, a little bit of a, a different view on this. I think people should be careful what they wish for with efficiency. I think Bitcoin being, for lack of word, inefficient with development is a feature, not a bug. I think it's good to grind people down a little bit when they want to add new things or do things. Because realistically, the project works. 
right? Now is just ours to destroy it. So as much as you know, I am of the camp of what's called gardening, I like the idea of Bitcoin being properly gardened. We did, you know, and maintained. You know, there is features that I personally work, but they could cause disasters too, right? Like upvault or whatever, right? Anything is now without trade-offs and possible consequences and unknown consequences. So I don't know, like I, I'm a little scared for lack of a different way of explaining. I'm a little scared of things being efficient on core. To counter that a little bit, the, uh, you know, I spoke to a core dev and the potential, you know, for entropy to win <laughs> like gardening sounds nice but if you if it's so hard to get your your shovel out of the shed that you can only just do like a tiny little bit of work like entropy is going to like beat you in the garden i'm stretching this this metaphor yeah but bit. there is no entropy to beat us right i mean the project is working well you know there's 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 bit rot there's libraries and also if people leave the project who might have had like domain expertise in a portion yeah, yeah no that part I agree but that's why like you know you want a garden master you know like the guy is like you know tired and he starts training another guy you know like and and that's it like you can pass it on i guess like my fear is i don't want volume of software changes right i don't want like just a lot of shit being worked on on Bitcoin. I want like less things being worked on on Bitcoin. They may still be important, but like, you know, really guys, like I, I we can really screw this butch. Like we can really fuck this up. Don't, I agree with what you're saying, but don't mistake for, I mean, keep in mind, the last thing I said was without sacrificing security, quality and decentralization. So, oh, yeah. absolutely. No, no, this was not a criticism Towards you, yeah, you gotta you gotta sort of hold that constant. So I agree. If those are being sacrificed for volume or efficiency, that's that's the see, wrong approach. Th- here's the thing: we we are people, right? Like humans, humans are great to fucking shit up too, right? So like everybody, including me, right? Everybody wants to see their favorite idea and feature go in, right? So if it's more efficient to do it, it's more likely to get in. That's all. Like. You know, like maybe it's a stupid fear, but you know, no, I think it needs to be top of mind and we need to be vigilant. But having said that, we are so far on the end of the spectrum of no, like things like peer to peer V2, like BIP 324 have been worked on since before I joined Bitcoin in 2017. Erlay has been around, that project's been around for like five years. Package Relay. Mm-hmm. Has been around for many, many, many years. The kernel project, trying to get actually make the core project actually core, which you know, which has all kinds of benefits. Massive well, benefits. you know, Gavin, Gavin started it, so it's probably bad. Yeah, I mean, it's been around forever. So I mean, these are they, these are not like ideas that we cooked up last week and we want to cram into the next release. These are things that have been worked on for for many, many years. But I, I do like the idea of like a five to ten year timeline for things to get in. You know, it grinds people down, sure. which is fantastic. So let's get the, the, if you look at the, the things that the project shows <laughs> as the top three projects have been around, have been worked on for five to 10 years. It's BIP 324, you yeah. know, peer-to-peer V2, massive benefits. Yeah, Dhruv wrote it. Was it Dhruv? Yeah, he's most recently worked on, yep. But, you know, that, that, that stem, like Greg Maxwell and Peter designed at least the initial iteration, like in, I think, 27. Set 2017 or 2018. And then, and Package Relay. And like we talked about earlier, like with high fees and lightning and security and um, Package Relay is very important for, for that. Just so you guys know, we are about halfway through the list and it's been an hour and 45 minutes. We're not going to, no, we're going to do another 15, 30 to 40 minutes max. I, I, I fully agree with you, Steve. So, all right. So, Burak announces ARC. Arc is a second layer solution designed to help scale Bitcoin. It's essentially a lightning competitor. I'm very happy that there is a lightning competitor that is not necessarily compatible. Uh, I've been wanting this for, for years. There were 50 papers of lightning. We shouldn't have had one implementation. We should have had five where like three fail and two continue being competitors, right? This is the part that I think people miss. Bitcoin is how we find interop. We don't have to interrupt the second layers between each other necessarily, right? Uh, we can always clear to Bitcoin. 
But anyways, this this arc thing is cool. I, I have not had a chance to like really dig in there, but I, I like the idea of virtual UTXOs, even though that's kind of inflation in some way or another. <laughs> Barack gave a, a presentation in Austin. I believe he also did one in Miami. Yes. I didn't see that one. I missed it. It's pretty cool. I think the the uh, uh, my like very loose kind of hand wavy understanding of it's like you kind of think about it. It's like eCash, but it's doing all the coordination on chain. So it's doing kind of its state updates on chain. And so the way it does those is is one of these service providers is like writing a cha- like a, tra- a transaction like every five seconds. So like there is not enough block space to have hundreds of these service providers. It might be in the order of tens or 10. So it, it's, it's, it's pretty interesting where it could handle tons of volume, low latency payments. It also is interoperable with Lightning. His original design was just trying to kind of thought of it as an extension to lightning, but then he kind of realized that it could be its own system. Uh, there's some pretty cool cryptography stuff in there. I do believe he needs... <laughs> the worst cool cryptographer, cool and cryptography <laughs> should never go together. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, he, he used fun, big words that I didn't understand, so I felt like okay. something important was happening, you know? <laughs> but uh, it does require some soft forks, a soft fork to, I think it's for non-interactivity. The other interesting thing, thing with this V UTXO, so you don't have to run an always online like lightning node to or a, a arc node to like know if your funds are safe but like Geekash, you're issued like a certificate you have to kind of re-up it every four weeks if you don't go back and swap your token for like a new certificate then it goes to it, it cascades down to basically whoever's running the service provider ends up owning that so there is like some kind of trade-off uh, it's not it, it's some there trade-offs. trade-offs. There's there's a lot of trade-offs, but I think the biggest one to me is that f- transaction every five seconds just sounds crazy. But he also, I mean, he has a little green, yellow, red chart comparing. I thing. love that chart. It's <laughs> any, anytime it's full green for your solution <laughs> and a lot of reds for others, <laughs> you got to question whether that's biased. So, but to start off, I I totally agree, MBK. Like. The more layer two solutions, the, the merrier. Like that, so I, I think it's fantastic that this has been proposed. I have not spent enough time on it to deeply understand it. So I just I've been picking up tidbits and questions from other people that need need to be explored. I know Z Man is um, asking questions on the mailing list, trying to tease out the double spending potential with Arc. And I'm still not clear on the answer there. It sounds like it's somewhere between the ASP can be like the service provider can can double spend within a, you know within like six block confirmations, which is similar to zero conf Lightning LSP, or it could be like they could double spend at any point in time. And I so I, I kind of want to see a resolution to that question because if it's the latter, that that's a that's a major trade off. Um, mm. If it's the former. That's a reasonable trade-off, it, you know, if you get good properties from that. What's interesting here is that it seems that everything goes back to eCash. It's really weird. <laughs> yeah, although, well, I mean, if it's, you know, if you're if there's a level of trust for one hour, and then it's final, you know, that's that's very different than trusting the entire time. And then you mentioned a soft fork. I think it's CTV. It needs CTV to like to really shine and be non-interactive. Or any prevout. Oh, either one. Okay. And prevout is essentially the the shit version of CTV. Yeah, I saw someone post that, or James O'Byrne said that. I, I like that. It, it's a pretty reasonable view. That that wasn't my impression. My impression was any prevout has more limited application than CTV, but it was simpler. But maybe, I mean, maybe that's wrong. But I don't, I don't think it's simpler. I think CTV, Jeremy Roman did like this really in-depth explanation of why he thinks APO is making a lot more assumptions mm-hmm. and has a lot more complexity than CTV, but obviously he was... Yeah, okay. Yeah, he had a dog in that fight. I need to update my, my, my mental model there. No, it's like the problem is you, you go into galaxy brain territory very fast there. 
Mm. This thing seems sort of like heuristically like, oh, you know, like, yeah, you can make this assumption or that assumption. But like, I don't know, I was trying to dive into some of this stuff. It's like, it really breaks your head very fast. Unfortunately, that's that's the problem with some of these primitives in Bitcoin is that, you know, th there's like five people who can really understand it. <laughs> and then you're mm. sort of depending on their understanding and their biases to, to infer. Kind of like SegWit was very much like that. I mean, Barak's latest email this morning on the mailing list said that another future extension depends on an op code like that would need to be added, like op cat. So, I think we we need we just need to better understand like what are Arc's properties with today's Bitcoin and then potential tomorrow's Bitcoin. I think that's important to to evaluate. You know, but that's no that's no different than Lightning was, right? There was Lightning. We're gonna try to do this without SegWit, which was like very difficult and super super horrible in terms of trade offs. And then you know, like they kept on building and until sort of like SegWit came, right? I think you could assume that one more thing like either APO, CTV, or any preview, like one of these properties will come. There seems to be a certain consensus that one of these things will come and they'll come with different sets of trade-offs, right? So I, I don't know, like I, I used to be a CTV lover and then a CTV hater, and then the CTV push made it even more hater out of me. And then after Upvolta, I'm again a CTV lover. So like, you know, mm. strong, strong beliefs loosely <laughs> held, right? <laughs> I don't know. It's just cool. Like, I'm just happy to see new shit being worked on. I think that if they depend on a soft fork, brace yourself for five, 10 years. Yep. I agree. My heuristic always has been, it's just like, you know, Bitcoin is such an improbable once in a millennia kind of generation. So it's so, so special. What are the odds that we had the exact right L2 design first try in Bitcoin? So impossible. Not that lightning is exactly the first, first try. I mean, but we did have, we did have markets and, uh, and almost poker on the original client. So, you know, like, <laughs> I don't believe the path that Satoshi originally had for Bitcoin was exactly where we're going, uh, which is fine. That's how it works. Uh, you know, electricity was no different. Okay. Next, MicroStrategy announces a Lightning platform. Uh, you know, instead of giving marketing dollars to Facebook, give it directly to the users with, with sats. I kind of like that idea. Wallet to Satoshi has processed 9 million Lightning payments. Probably all of it on Zaps. <laughs> Noster is the ultimate use case for Lightning, right? 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 So far. <laughs> Zebedee announces a Node.js SDK for Zebedee API. They do have a, it seems to be a pretty solid, like, like a Lightning as a service kind of offering. A lot of people seem to be using them. I think uh, Fountain uses them. Bitcoin becomes a non-KYC exchange. That's pretty cool. Hodo Hodo and Bisk announced Lightning integration coming soon. That's neat. Also, Hodo Hodo seems to be making some some inwards into uh, uh, decentralized land fi. So not just uh, you know they're trying to find pools of liquidity. They're a bit more decentralized for people to borrow against whatever. Uh, it's kind of neat. And Max is a beast. Yeah, go ahead, Steve. I don't see um, the challenges with those uh, as just developing a market, right? Um, another one, something I don't see in the list is Lava, and and it's a new app that just launched in in Miami, LAVA, and I think they they do a lot of a lot of cool things. Um, I'm an investor in it, just as a disclaimer. But um, no, please, please go ahead. No, seriously, please. Uh, like the whole point of the show is to let people know about stuff. So uh, we're gonna add the notes. It's a, it's a mo mobile app. You can. Um, you know, it's a Bitcoin wallet, but they also they, what's innovative and interesting. I mean, first of all, they have it's a slick UI and a good backup system for a mobile app. But the most in innovative thing is that they're using DLC technology to do loans. So you can use your the Bitcoin you hold as collateral in a loan to get U.S. dollar stable coins in their app. I raise it in, in, because they're going to face the challenge of developing that market. 
you know, and, and find, finding lenders, matching lenders with, with lendees. So that'll be a big challenge, but it's really cool that they're, I, I think, you know, they're using DLC technology to do it. So it's a lot more trustless than giving your coins to, you know, a third party like BlockFi or whomever. That's right. So it's great to see this innovation. Um, and, I, and I hope they find a way to, to actually develop the, a, a market around it. I, I think the, the path of least resistance is ganging up, right? So I think that's why BISC and Hodo Hodo are starting to talk together about sharing liquidity, right? So if all these guys start sharing liquidity, now they create a network of liquidity, right? And whoever has the best sort of, you know, combination of features and things is going to have more clients, but but they wouldn't exist without having a network of liquidity. So uh, I don't know. I, I'm pretty like hopeful and optimist on this space. I, I think the future is decentralized liquidity. Uh, I think, you know, we are going to find our way there. It's going to take a long time. It's not an easy problem, but it's definitely solvable in my view. Emboss Technologies is collecting personal information about Lightning Network and its users and selling it to third parties. So go fuck yourselves. <laughs> yeah, it's. I mean, looking at their terms Spooks. of service, it seems. It seems like they're. You know, like there's public information in Lightning, right? Like there's on an on-chain footprint for a public channel that you're. You know, you're. And there's ways to, in, for, in some cases, get information about a private channel just through probing and stuff. But there is information that you know very specifically, and when you link up with Amboss, if you're giving it to them and then they're giving it a chain analysis it's kind of a big deal so uh, you know it seems like their terms of service are fully allowing them to do, to do that and uh, you know so you know emboss exists but also they do thunderhub as well which is how a lot of people operate their lnd nodes so they potentially do know a lot about what's going on in the lightning network boys and girls there is better ways of making money don't sell out to the spooks right away, okay? There is ways. And remember, you know, if you're going to use the line, but if I don't do it, somebody else will. Here's the real truth is that the bad guys don't have imagination. Otherwise, they'd be doing it already. So you are giving alpha to the people who are going to kill your projects. You know, go do something else with your lives for fuck's sake. Um, all right, so integration, uh, we could maybe combine these two. So it looks like uh, Bitcoin and Lightning are happening in Mexico. Lots of stuff there. Ibex is integrating with a bunch of stuff. So, it's, so there is a few Bitcoin Magazine articles on it. Business news. Strike always has a big announcement of Bitcoin Miami. And uh, now they're, they're integrating another 65 new countries, and they're moving the headquarters to El Salvador. Very cool. Paxvo is back online. Not gonna get into the details of it, but you know, don't have your funds there anymore. It's complicated. Stripe announces uh, Stripe hosted fiat to crypto on ramps. This is kind of a huge deal. Uh, I don't think people understand how big Stripe is and and like the volume that they do and the amount of integrations they have. We use Stripe for credit cards. These guys write some fantastic software. So I, I really hope to see them uh, having uh, dipping their toes on this and then offering some more interesting Bitcoin to Bitcoin things. They're going to probably call it crypto group of things. Go ahead. So, but this this isn't so like you can you can sell a sweatshirt for Bitcoin. Yeah. This is like so that you can offer something like an exchange. Yep. It, it's just interesting. Like for for these guys to be touching this stuff is it's like it's kind of making inroads into into corporate America. Would you say they're they are direct competitor, right, to Block, Steve? Kind of. I mean, Stripe has you know their bread and butter is online payments, shopping carts, and Block, you know, with Square initially was like in person merchants. Mm -hmm. So I think that's each company's sweet spot. Of course, Block then has had a lot of success with Cash App. So you know, I, I think it's more like the companies could. Butt heads in as they grow in the future, as opposed to being direct competitors right now. Right. Well, thanks for clarifying that. But I totally agree. Stripe, it just makes sense for them to support Bitcoin and Lightning. I'm actually good friends with their CTO. I worked with them at Google many years ago and know quite a few other people there. But all my conversations with folks there, it's more of a wait and see attitude, uh, at least yep. with respect to Lightning. 
you know, they want to see the metrics and the usage. And so there's less vision <laughs> around it. It's more like, we're, we're going to wait until others build it and make it happen. And then we'll join. And they don't want to be the lab, right? They don't want to be the yeah. lab. They want to say, okay, well, this stack is now proven. We're going to integrate. And it's going to work great. Yeah. Would you say that? Do you know a fun story? So we have Stripe on CoinKite for like many, many, many years, right? And many, many, many years ago, they blocked our account because they thought we were selling Bitcoin sticks. <laughs> and the open dime is a Bitcoin stick, but it doesn't have Bitcoin in it. <laughs> they went and they took a look and they're like, okay, you're not selling Bitcoin for credit card payments. <laughs> and they reactivated the account. They were very apologetic, but uh, it was funny. And the reason why you should accept Bitcoin for everything, because then nobody else can stop you. I imagine they see nine million zaps. <laughs> so I don't think he, I don't think even nine million dollars of volume on on Lightning yeah. would be a splash for them. No, no, these guys are playing at a different level. Bitcoin rewards company Fold expands to El Salvador as well. It's going to be interesting. I mean, there is like what. Five, three, five million people in El Salvador. It's that size country, I imagine. It's a lot of uh, service providers coming in. Good for them for attracting Bitcoiners. Bottle Pay app is closing on Monday, 24th. Bitrax Inc. filed for <laughs> Chapter 11. Nice. Another exchange bites the dust. Funding. Fatty raised 17 mil. Okay, you guys are going to have to buy a lot of uh, T-shirts now to give at conferences. Great project. It's nice to see. Yeah, I know I mentioned it before, but you know they just they just launched their Fetty Alpha. Yep. One, of the, one of the coolest things that you can do with the, with the Fetty app that you can do offline, send and receive. So that you're, you're, you're trusting basically that they're not going to double spend you before you get online. But it's it's like an experience that I haven't had before in Bitcoin, other than physically handing somebody an open dime, of to like, hey, we just we just moved money without the internet. Yeah, no, that's that's always been fascinated with that this idea of just like here, here's an AUTXO that was a Sats card, you know, like here, take it. Mm. Uh, mm. It's confirmed already too. Funny thing is, I wasn't a uh, I was landing, and the Wi-Fi stops working, but you don't have LTE yet, right? And I found out that none of the Bitcoin wallets on the phone are able to do a uh, transaction, even though they have the UTXO information offline, just because they use mm -hmm. all the fucking things, the, all the APIs to, to do everything. So that was very disheartening. So, uh, yeah, if you're a wallet dev out there, you know, do the transactions offline because you don't need to do anything to sign as long as you have UTXO information. HRF. Uh, donated a, a, to a bunch of uh, Bitcoin-related projects. I'm not going to go through all of them, but uh, there were uh, half a million dollars sent to 12 projects. That's very cool. Uh, River raised 35 mil. Tether will regularly allocate 15% of its net realized operating profits to buying Bitcoin. That's huge. I don't know if you guys know this, but Tether makes more money than BlackRock. People don't realize how like these motherfuckers are good at this. Like, and they're like ten guys, kind of thing. <laughs> That's also why the all the tether fud over the years. First of all, the evidence produced by tether fudders never seem to be actual real evidence. No. But secondly, they have an amazing business model. Yeah. Like, <laughs> that, huge. like you can you can get filthy rich while still being ethical. So. Who knows? Maybe there are shenanigans, but the, the incentive model there is not to, to pull shenanigans. Well, the, the, it's the opposite, right? The incentive to them, because they already print money, essentially, right? Like It's like, it's ridiculous. It's obscene, uh, the amount of money that they make. Like, their incentive is to, become, is to be as risk-averse as possible as a business so that they don't screw this up. And like... And that translates into consumer trust in their bag, right? I mean, they're a huge buyer of treasuries now. <laughs> you know, soon they're going to probably have more treasuries than some of the, the, the banks in America, right? That would be hilarious. Can you imagine, like, this, this wildcat entity that pegs the dollar has more treasuries than JP Morgan or something? You know, it, it's within, it's within the, the path. I mean, like, it's not a wild gas. Anyways... Uh, good for them. 
uh, we list them on bitcointreasuries.net now. Uh, so they, they are a tracked entity. Brink, oh, Marathon donated a, a million dollars to uh, Brink uh, for core development. That's great. Uh, by the way, if anybody wants to donate to OpenSats, it is a 501c3. So uh, you do get, instead of paying taxes, donate your money. You know, that's essentially my pitch now. Is, is Spiral takes donation or no? No. No, it's it's block only. Yeah, so I direct folks to bring OpenSats HRF are all cool. three great places to go. And OpenSats is uh, also a pass-through. We keep nothing. We're idiots. Mining, <laughs> mining, marathon, digital audience, uh, zero to and uh, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's all boring stuff. Okay, government and politics. Let's just skip this because it's a waste of everybody's life. Nobody cares about politics, but we do list it on the show. If you care about this stuff, go, go read it there. A bunch of government-related stuff to Bitcoin. Ooh, reads. Uh, Watchtowers on Lightning Network by Voltage Cloud. How do Lightning Network fees work by Voltage? Seeding a Bitcoin marketplace by Pablo. Using space chains and Fediment to solve scaling by Fiat Jaff. Bitcoin CTV Covenants and Enigma by Polly D. Do you guys have any reads that you guys want to suggest? <laughs> I just watch no, no, YouTube man. videos. Although, I mean, one thing I've been, I've been reading a lot about Apple's like key management design recently because some of the new, like Envoy is the new Bitcoin wallet and um, Lava also has a cloud backup solution. And they're both using Apple, Apple's keychain. And I I had a bunch of concerns about it, but the more I learn, I'm, I'm actually really impressed that Apple, as such a huge company, has prioritized the engineering work they put behind their keychain. Well, it's because, like, you know, reminder, like, you know, it's not just Bitcoin, right? There's a bunch of stuff that the Apple has to secure in the cloud for customers. And ideally, they don't have the keys because, you know, medical data, like every fucking app on your phone now has a bunch of stuff that could like destroy your life if it goes public, right? For some people. So, you know, it's in their interest to keep. But mind you, like, I mean, it's, I'd say it's like, a hundred percent chance mine is a mistake that there is a backdoor, right? Because it has to have a backdoor and that's how you not go to jail as a company or, you know, so keep that in mind. Uh, assume there is a backdoor in a backup where the state can get to it. Yeah. I'm not going to argue against that. The, the, I mean, the, the, the bottom line, you, the, you, you still have to trust. Yep. But it's nice to see them actually invest so much engineering work into creating a good architecture and communicating it. Yeah. And you know, so they do. They do have an HSM that holds keys, which can help recover. But they claim their design is that you only get like ten. 10 tries. So even they, you know, cannot brute force the user's passcode or password or whatever. And they claim to have thrown away the access cards to update the firmware, right? So you have to trust all that, but at least it's it's still better <laughs> that they claim to have this design and they probably do have this design. Now, is there also a backdoor? I, I think, you know, I don't think anyone can say like, yeah, we should all be confident that there's not. Well, so so here's the thing. If you're interested in this, I highly recommend reading. When uh, it was a few years ago, I can't remember if it was the beginning of iCloud or like the second version of iCloud. They released a huge paper on key shuffle, how you do key shuffle to set up the HSMs. You know, like it was very interesting, like super cool protocol, you know, like lots of thinking behind similar to what you're describing. It's probably based on that. But again, the issue is, the trust is, do they throw out the cards? Two is, you know, implementation mis mistakes happen. Three is implementation mistakes happen, right? Because again, massive enterprise. And the whole point of Bitcoin is don't trust verify, right? Like, I, I think that's that's ultimately, and I got to this argument with, with, uh, with Pascal on the what Bitcoin did thing, which is like, because he's coming from the trust, don't verify, uh, market like you know, smart cards, enterprise security, all audited, all certified by government bodies, all this shit, right? Like 
it's very hard for us to come to a point in which we can have a reasonable conversation because we're coming from the complete opposite sides, right? Like, and my side is very simple. It's just simply don't trust. It's not that I'm inferring that you're malicious. It's not, I mean, none of that, right? Like my point is, is like, you shouldn't have to trust things that you can verify. And uh, so, so that's the thing with the, the Apple stuff. Just assume they can get to it. That's always sort of like the best way to, to think about this kind of like security primitives. All right, boys. I think we're we're pretty much at the end here. I see this uh, audience question. Mm-hmm. Go for it. And I've got a good read that relates to it. The audience question is, how many words of a 24-word seed phrase you, you'd need to know in the correct order for the full seed phrase to become realistically brute forceable? And I don't know the answer for 24 words, but there's this really good piece by uh, John Contrell where uh, there was like a Bitcoin giveaway where somebody published like the first eight words of a 12 word mnemonic, which meant there was like 80 bits. like 1.1 trillion possibilities to guess from. And he brute forced it using a bunch of GPUs to spend them about $350 on GPUs in the cloud. And this is almost three years ago. So it's probably probably faster and better. So don't definitely don't leak eight words of your 12 word. <laughs> so, you know, know, but it's a really good piece. It's really fun. You know, we've we've had those discussions and I think Steve was uh once uh slipped in my DMs in the in his Bitcoin early days there about why do we use 24 words? You know, Bitcoin is is 256 bits, but it really only takes 128 bits and then stretches, right? But you could feed it the 256 bits if you want to and you know and and then like so the funny story about that is that like you can't you can't prove that you can break 24 hours but you can also not disprove it either it's a range issue it's a math like thing that we can't figure it out because of the size of the number so one cool thing that comes there's it's a couple of cool things that come from 24 words even if entropically speaking like it's not necessary so one is you have more room for losing things, right? Because you have more words. So if you leak a few, it's not the end of the world. Another thing too is that if you want to be in a pinch, you can just cut in half and you still have 128 bits on each side. We're a little bit shy because the 24th word is is a checksum, but still, the attacker doesn't know which one is going to be the one that has the, <laughs> the checksum too. So, you know, I don't know. I feel like for for like long-term life savings and single SIG, 24 words is the way to go. Uh, if you're going to do multi-SIG and do other things, 12 words is definitely more manageable. I mean, if you have had to stamp 24 words in metal, man, it's a pain in the ass. Uh, and also reviewing that, make sure you didn't make any mistakes. I just shared a link that you might want to put in the show notes. This, is, um, this question came up a year or two ago where someone wanted to see 24 word support in the photon project Mm -hmm. and Peter Wola and Lloyd Fournier weighed in with some really good, I mean, basically for all intents and purposes, 12 words, 128 bits is sufficient security, but they do paint a potential future possibility where the 24 words could save you. So, yeah, I mean, basically, it's consistent with what you just said, MBK. Like, you know, if you're ultra paranoid, if it's enough money. Yeah, I mean, like, you know, I'm, I'm thinking 100 years, right? It's like I'm thinking 100 yeah. years. You're, you're long dead, yeah. right? Like, and, and the family doesn't know. They might not move the money. You know, it's just, I don't know. Like, I, I like thinking of things that are going to stick around for at least 100 years, right? Like, it's a good way of, like, just having a framework for your head when you're doing your self-custody. You'll likely change it, but still. Just use bacon for your for your key. <laughs> bacon is great. <laughs> is that the library that just writes bacon? No, there's a there's a private key that, that I think the checksum works and everything. It's just all bacon. Right. Great. Don't listen to Paul. All right, folks, uh, I think we can close this out. I really appreciate you guys spending two hours and 20 minutes reviewing Bitcoin projects. If somebody doesn't talk about it, it doesn't get talked about it. So, uh, Paul, any final thoughts? 
Yeah, definitely get the get the fatty alpha and get mutiny on Cigna and send fake money back and forth. There's faucets for both of them. That's a good way to to test out some apps without losing sats. Steve, uh, any final thoughts? Well, I'm going to plug uh, Spiral is hiring, but it's you know this is non commercial, free, open source software positions. I think it's good for all, good for the whole Bitcoin ecosystem. We're hiring three. Uh, what we're calling wizards, but I'd say OG wizards, not this NFT wizard weird stuff clown show. I, but I, I don't know what the new wizard is. You just use the weird as our meme. But back to like IRC channel wizards. So we're looking for hardcore, deeply technical engineers who want to work on hard problems in Bitcoin and have the time and space and freedom to uh, to make, make things happen. Very cool. And... Uh... If you're a wizard that doesn't want to work on Spiral, you can always come to Open Science. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna start a little rivalry there, Steve. Uh, we're gonna we're gonna count how many how many wizards did we fund. I'm kidding. This is all for a great cause. That's that's why we can have a laugh uh, at it. Yeah. Uh, listen, I I, I I deeply deeply appreciate all the work that that you guys uh, put into all this, and uh, thanks for coming on. And with that, we press stop recording. Thanks for listening. For more resources, check the show notes. We put a lot of effort into them. And remember, we don't have a crystal ball. So let us know about your project. Visit bitcoin.review to find out how to get in touch. Mm-hmm.